Well, hello. Thanks for joining me. This is a sermon for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. The lectionary text is Mark 10, starting at verse 32 and going through verse 45. So we begin, as always, with the lesson. They were on the road, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise again. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here ends our lesson. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So people of God, grace to you in peace. From God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in his one precious Holy Spirit. Amen. As our lesson begins today, Jesus is on the road to Jerusalem, and you and I who know this story know what will happen there. We know that he is on his way to be betrayed and denied, brutalized, and killed. We know why he's going, and we at least have a sense of what it means for us and for the world. But those following Jesus, they were some combination of amazed and afraid. And so Jesus takes the twelve aside and he gives them the clearest and most detailed synopsis yet of what awaits him. He is nothing if not clear. See, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. It seems absolutely incredible to us, doesn't it, that anyone could hear such a thing and be unmoved? How could anyone hear Jesus speak in this way and not be struck silent or moved to tears? Sadly, it doesn't surprise us that the disciples are unmoved. But the brazenness of their reaction is truly horrifying. James and John come to him, and they ask him for primacy in the coming kingdom. Presumably, they think Jesus is being dramatic or overwrought, that all the things he's saying will happen probably are the equivalent of our, look, it's going to be really, really tough. It's going to require sweat and blood and tears, but then we will prevail. And when the prevailing rolls around, James and John want to make sure that they come out on top. One would hope that among the other ten disciples, there'd be someone with a bit of grace, someone with a bit of a conscience. Alas, no such luck. When the other ten hear of James and John's request, they respond with anger. Oh, they're not angry that the brothers were insensitive when they heard Jesus predict his own suffering and death. They're angry that the brothers are trying to get a leg up on them. They're angry that James and John are trying to freeze them out. Every one of the twelve is thinking about himself, about his place, about his standing. Each of them is self-absorbed. 
and each of them on some level sees Jesus as a vehicle to be used for their own security and aggrandizement. Each of them is primarily concerned that they be close enough to Jesus to rise with him and to enjoy the benefits and perks of his enthronement. Each of them is concerned that they receive a place of glory, and each one believes that he is entitled. None of them have a thought for anyone else. And of course, that's us too. You think James and John are brash? You think it takes a special kind of selfish boldness to ask to sit at Jesus' left and right side in the coming kingdom? Think through that prayer that the TV preachers commend for us, that we would make Jesus our personal Lord and Savior, that we would say these 15 or 20 words that obligate him, the Lord of life and the King of Kings, to rescue us and to lift us up no matter what else we ever do, whatever else we don't do. Seen clearly, this thought makes Jesus nothing more than a reliable mule. And it makes us Jesus' Lord and Master, because we control and shape and limit what the Lord can do. James and John never had anything like that kind of arrogance, right? Now, we, good Lutherans all, are substantially more sophisticated than that. We remember and we confess that Jesus doesn't work for us, but in his grace, calls us to himself and leads us home. We do strive to remember that he is the Lord and that we are not. Sadly, this awareness is also fleeting. We, are t we too are mostly concerned to know that our sins are forgiven and that we have peace with God and that we have a place in heaven. We endeavor to get the confession right, right? that's important, that we're justified by grace through faith and not by works, but then we imagine that there's nothing for us to do. We're saved, hallelujah! And we go to sleep, sleeping the sleep of the righteous, imagining that we are good, that we have arrived. And in the rest of our lives, in our personal lives, our professional lives, our political lives, we care mostly about ourselves, our rights, our compensation, our freedom. If we think of the other at all, it's as an opponent, an adversary. We want to be the ones who are blessed. We want to be rich. We want to be unencumbered. We want to be free. Well. Jesus would set us free, James and John and the other 10 and all of us who follow him today. But it's nothing like the path to freedom that we imagine. It's nothing like the path that we ordinarily walk. Jesus says, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lorded over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus calls us today and every day to pour out our lives in active service to our neighbors. Jesus calls us to follow him and to find ourselves in emptying ourselves to intentionally embrace lives of sacrifice and love. In one of his Advent sermons, Martin Luther expounded on this theme. Luther said, if you find yourself in a work by which you accomplish something good for God or the holy or yourself, but not for your neighbor alone, then you should know that that work is not a good work. For each one ought to live, speak, act, hear, suffer, and die in love and service for another even for one's enemies. A husband for his wife and children, a wife for her husband, children for their parents, servants for their masters, masters for their servants, rulers for their subjects, and subjects for their rulers, so that one's hand, mouth, eye, foot, heart, and desire is for others. These are Christian works, good in nature. Let's confess together today, you and me, that 
This is absolutely foreign to us. But it's something we can learn, something we can practice. On, on the Sunday where this sermon will be preached in the church, many of our 5th, 6th, and 8th grade uh, students will be receiving communion for the second time, that they received it for the first time last month. And in both churches, if you were to visit, you can find banners made by the children that they could introduce themselves to the church family. And the banners show each child's families and hobbies and interests, and each one of them is rendered on a hand towel. The reason for the towel is twofold. First, it's in remembrance of each child's baptism. In baptism, each one of them was made part of the family of God, forgiven their sins, and set free to serve. Second, though, the towel is in remembrance of Jesus, who on the last night of his life washed his disciples' feet and dried them with the towel. The children have been taught that they join us not as young royalty, but as followers of Jesus called into a life of service. May it be in each one of our prayers that these young Christians could look to us and see examples of Jesus' priorities and Jesus' call in our lives. May our lives increasingly be characterized by acts of love and service. May we think less and less about our standing our rights, our freedoms, our privileges, and may we follow Jesus and spend our lives and our strength in his service, loving those whom he loves. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.